next coming to the stage. A man who puts his family before anyone and anything. He believes in second chances and he shows love and compassion to everyone. This guy is full of humor and he's one of the funniest people I ever met. Please everybody, give a round of applause for Diego Pilco. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell my story. I'm from Ecuador. I have been incarcerated for 16 years. Let me fill in on what got me here and the progress I have made over the years. At the age of 18, I decided to immigrate to the United States, seeking a better life and a future for my family, especially my parents. My parents took a $13,000 loan from the bank in order to pay the smuggler to take me here, not a jail, but the United States. It was a risky journey. Many people have died attempting the very journey that I was about to take, but that didn't stop me. I was determined to follow my dreams. The hardest thing to do was saying goodbye to my family. Back in June of 2005 was the last time I hugged and kissed my parents and siblings. On that day, they all got tears in their eyes and they, and they were praying for my safety. At the moment, I want to cry as well, but I held back my tears because I have to be strong for them. Once I stepped on the bus to start my journey, tears started coming from my eyes like a waterfall. It was hours before I could stop. I was nervous and scared. I didn't know what kind of obstacles I was going to face, but I keep reminding myself that I have to be strong for my family because they are counting on me to get to the United States. It took me 20, 20 days to get to my destination. I was lucky. It was a quick. For many migrants, it takes up to two months, sometimes more. My older brother and cousins has been in the U.S. for a couple of years. They were waiting for me with open arms. They helped me get a job in construction, an apartment shared with them, and they showed me the ropes of New York City. My dreams were to send money to my parents for the loan, help them financially, build me a house, buy me a car, and eventually return back home to my loved ones. Unfortunately, all my hopes and dreams were crushed when out of fear, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I am ashamed to say this. On November 2006, I took the life of a beautiful lady. She was a devoted wife, mother, and had big dreams. Because of my actions, her family's life would change forever. Their hearts broken because of me. My family paid for my actions as well. I have been living with this cute remorse and shame since that day. And it will continue to be part of me for the rest of my life. I ended up being convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to 25 years in prison. I was 19 when I came to prison. I had never been in any type of jail before. I was scared. I thought life was over for me. I was all alone and I felt hopeless. I didn't speak or understand English. I don't know what would have happened to me in jail. Of course, suicide crossed my mind. At this point, I didn't know if I would ever see my parents or family again. So what was the purpose for me to leave? When I told my mom on the phone that I was sentenced to 25 years, and at the time, I didn't know when I was going to see her again. We started crying. I will never forget the day when my mom cried so hard. It broke my heart. I asked my mom for forgiveness because I have failed her as a son. I let her and my whole family down. You know how strong the love of a mother is. She said, son, don't worry about it. I don't have to forgive you. You have to ask God to forgive you. And I'm sure one day I will see you and hug you again. Now, 17 and a half years later, I'm still waiting for the hug. My parents have tried twice to obtain a humanitarian visa for a two week stay just to come and visit me. They never have been approved. The reason was that the first time, because they they don't let them come because of my crime for what I have done. 
The second, the second reason was that the Embassy of the United States needs proof that my family, my parents have a strong reason to return back to Ecuador. Otherwise, they were denied. So the same situation has happened to countless families of incarcerated individuals. Many people in here have not been able to see their families in decades. The first couple of years in state prison, I was lost. I didn't care about my education, programs. Secondly, I wasn't thinking about my future. I was just wasting my time. What I needed school for? I got 25 years, I was saying to myself. People started to see this. And when I say people, it's guys who's been in jail for a long time, we call OGs. They encouraged me to get my education. They told me get my GED, get involved in, get involved in programs, get involved in church, and, and everything's gonna be right. I'm not only gonna do this for myself, but also I wanna do, I wanna show my family that I was doing something with my life despite the circumstance. So in 2011, I get my GED. That's when life started to change for the better. Many doors started to open with the GED, better jobs and programs, all of them requiring me to help someone in need. My first job working with my GED was working as a teacher aide, helping the Spanish speakers. At the time, my English wasn't that good, but I assisted them in getting their education. I started to focus on improving my English by listening to people's conversations, asking questions about how to pronounce and spare words. I'm still a doer today. I started reading books, magazines, newspapers in English to get better at it. And little by little, I got better. I hope to get just as fluent in English as I am in Spanish. Another program I have was working with the disabled. I was assigned to assist the blind. I was required to get them to the programs, assigned areas, medical appointments, I would clean and organize themselves. At the time, I was trying to read and write letters to their loved ones. This also motivated me to keep on learning English. The opportunity was very positive for me because I have learned a lot from those guys. But my next and current job is the one that I hope to use in the future. I'm currently the foreman of one of the tailored garment shops. We make boxes, pajamas, our rope, bad robes, uh, we make pillowcases, sheets, and many more. I teach the new guys on how to sew and operate different machines. I love the job. This is one of my passions. It's funny, because years ago I would ask myself that if I go out tomorrow, what kind of job will I do? I don't have any degrees or professional experience in any field. Once I found this tele shop and learned how to sew, Clothing, I know what I'm going to do once I return back to Ecuador. I want to open my own tele shop in my town, make clothes for the people, teach my family and anyone else who wants to learn this skill. I'm very busy in a tele shop, but also I'm a volunteer as a hospice worker. I've been doing hospice for four years, and let me tell you, these programs have made me the man I am today. I'm no longer that scared 19 year old with no goals. I have grown so much over the years. Being a hospice worker can be very hard, sitting with patients, taking care of all of their needs. It is a great feeling to show someone you never met compassion, love, and just be there with them so they're not alone. It doesn't matter what they don't. It's not a job to judge anyone. But the feeling sometimes is a little different when you know that person. Let me tell you, I got called to do a shift, and when I entered the room, I saw Jimmy. Jimmy has been in this facility for a while. I would greet him in a yard just a couple months before I got called to go sit with him. We even had playing a handball game together. Jimmy has lost a lot of weight, he was pale, and I froze. I can't believe it was him. He saw me and instantly recognized me. He was too weak to speak, but he gave me a thumbs up. I held his hand and asked him if he's going to be okay. And told him, Jimmy, I'm going to be right by his side so you know he's not, you're not alone. I saw tears coming from his eyes. I wiped them away and asked him if he was in pain so I can call the nurse. He shook his head, 
No. So I asked him, what should I do for him? He replied with a very weak voice, take me out of here. Take me out of here. Now, what can you say to him in that moment? Nobody want to die alone in prison. He was scared to close his eyes. I learned in my training that many patients don't want to go to sleep because they are afraid they will never wake up. Jimmy was closing and opening his eyes quickly. I told him not to be afraid. He can go to sleep. I promised him that I would be right by his eyes while he sleeps. He started at me and fell asleep knowing that he was not alone. Hours later, he woke up and saw that I was still there. He gave me his thumbs up. That was his way to say thank you. Hours later, it was time for me to go. I told him that I would be back in a couple of days. I later learned, a couple of hours later, Jimmy has passed away. Once I heard the news of Jimmy passing, I told myself that I would try to talk to and approach others, see if they need somebody to talk to. People go through pains and struggles, and you never know. I never knew what Jimmy was dealing with or how bad it was. This has given me a new lease on life, a new me. That's what I would like all you do to do the same. Help each other, look out for each other, and love each other. I hope to get involved in a hospice program in my community, spreading love, joy, and compassion to everyone. And I pray that I will have the chance to see my elderly parents so they can see the man I have become today. Thank you.